Hello, I'm Madison Bradley Cronkite. Thank you for joining me for my virtual talk, an automated approach to studying the evolution of the periconic cusp in a comprehensive sample of fossil and extant Eurconta. Traditionally, the tribostenic molar is treated as the homologous starting point or kind of an initial blueprint for marsupial and placental mammals with subsequent adaptive gains and losses of cusps and other features in various clades. Gaining or losing a dental cusp alters the occlusion of the upper and lower molars with potentially substantive influences on function. And this functional shift in biting and shearing abilities can have large adaptive consequences by opening dietary niches. For example, the acquisition of a hypocone and the associated increase in occlusal area is touted as a critical evolutionary novelty. Within a clade, the single alteration in cusp morphology is followed by marked increases in species diversification and is regarded as a prerequisite for the diversification and specialization of herbivores. In addition to their functional significance, cusps and their character states are also commonly used for phylogenetic analyses. For example, the paracondid is often utilized in character matrices to determine the phylogenetic affinities of primates, since the paracondid is variably present among prosimians. While it's relatively straightforward to categorize the paracondid as present or absent for some taxa, qualitative characterizations are prone to differ, like in lemur cata, where the paracondid has been described as both absent and weakly present. This leads to our research questions. First, we wanted to see how well does automated segmentation followed by segment-specific metrics capture anatomy compared to traditional discrete character states. Second, we wanted to see how the paracondid evolved throughout the primate lineage. And finally, we wanted to look at how independent the curvature of a region is from other regions within a tooth surface, or how strongly does the curvature of segments across a tooth surface co-vary. The goal of the Hecate algorithm is consistent segmentation of biological surface regions, where the surface regions are reflective of local shape similarity across a sample. If successful, this approach allows for more quantitative and objective descriptions of surface region characters. So how does this work? First, to characterize shape similarity across surfaces, Hecate uses continuous procrustes distance and produces surface point-to-point -point correspondence maps and mesh to mesh distances. Second, Hecate uses a diffusion map to put surface data into a comparable form based on point walk drift across point point maps. The diffusion map coordinates embed mesh data into a new multi dimensional space, kind of this Pringle shaped cloud here. Since all the mesh data is now in a similar form, nearness in the diffusion map equates to similarity across the original surfaces. The final step is then to use a machine learning technique to partition data into K groups, where K is user specified. Clustering partitions the coordinates of the diffusion map into however many groups the user assigns, and then translates these diffusion map coordinates back to the original surface coordinates. Following clustering, the regions now reflect this local shape similarity based on the probability of walk point drift on surface maps. Once surfaces within a sample are divided into segments or subregions by Hecate, you can then run analyses on specific regions of the tooth. For example, you can calculate how much of the total surface area of the tooth is sequestered by a given segment. You can also calculate the segment's curvature or DNE. Ariadne quantifies tooth curvature using a method comparable to the originally described Dirichlet normal energy or DNE but averages over local bandwidths of the tooth surface in a process that is more robust to variation in tooth face count and smoothing algorithms. So compared to DNA, Ariadne is more stable under a greater range of mesh preparation protocols. Specifically, analyses indicate that the effects of differing triangle count, mesh representation, noise, smoothing, and boundary triangles are much more limited on Ariadne than DNA. So this opens up a much larger sample for analyses. 
For this study, we ran Hecate with a K of 10 segments across a sample of 500 surfaces of second mandibular molars from 104 extant and fossil species within primates and UR content outgroups. For each segment, we calculated proportional area and Ariadne. To start, let's look at the results of the segmentation procedure. The 10 surface regions or segments determined by Hecate capture major features of the second molar like cusps, basins, and sidewalls. While categorizations of presence or absence of these surface features are important for questions of taxonomy, phylogeny, function, etc., we wanted to then explore if quantification of these surface regions could act as an objective and continuous trait. With that in mind, next I'll be focusing on the results specific to the mesial most segment. Periconid cusp and the corresponding region of teeth without periconids were both captured within the mesial most segment. When the curvature of the segment was calculated as Ariadne, the distribution of species average values doesn't have a neatly normal distribution. But when we grouped the values of genera with present periconids and absent periconids, a nice pattern emerges. Additionally, the values of genera with questionable periconid presence, like Lemurcata, which we mentioned at the beginning, they nest neatly between the distributions of absent and present. This difference in Ariadne, while continuous, is significantly different between each of these character states. The morphal space created by the relationship between proportional area of the segment and the curvature of the segment, perhaps unsurprisingly, also clusters neatly by character states. Where teeth without a periconid have relatively smaller mesial most segments with low curvature, and teeth with a periconid have relatively larger mesial most segments with high curvature. And the teeth described as having reduced or weak periconids kind of nestle in between. Additionally, some taxa that are typically categorized in the literature as lacking periconids present with high proportional area and curvature than could be expected. As it turns out, this is because these taxa possess other features within that region of the tooth that are not homologous to the periconid, but still have high degrees of curvature, which you can see in these two teeth here. After determining that segment-specific curvature was actually quantifying something of anatomical relevance, we ran an ancestral state reconstruction throughout the phylogeny of our UR content sample, starting with the basal UR content node. Each of these plots represent the posterior distribution of a 10,000 generation Bayesian MCMC method of estimating the values at internal nodes of interest within the tree informed by morphology of fossil taxa. The through line of this evolutionary story is the loss of the periconid through time in multiple lineages of primates. However, it also highlights that certain primate taxa like the insectivorous tarsiers and more fulvivorous lemurs like hapolemur and propithecus have convergently re-evolved high curvature in the mesial region of their molars. Following our analysis of the periconid, we quantified three more segments that encompass cusps, the protoconid, the enticonid, and the hypocongulid. We wanted to know if a tooth had a segment with high DNA, if all the other segments on that tooth were also highly curved, or if that regional curvature was independent of other parts of the occlusal surface. We found that there were groups that had high curvature or large cusps across the board, like the scandentians within the outgroup mammals or the tarsiers within new primates. There were also taxonomic groups that had low relief across all segments, like the catarines. However, some taxa had single segments with high DNA, like the injury of lemurs and the high DNA values of their enticonid region. To explore this covariation further, we quantified the phylogenetic correlation between the four segments. The curvature of the periconid was significantly correlated with the curvature of the protoconid, but was largely independent of the curvature measured for the hypoconulid and the enticonid. Meanwhile, the protoconid, hypoconulid, and enticonid were all significantly correlated with one another. All right, so let's zoom back out and think about the adaptive significance of all of this. By assessing cusp morphology as continuous regional curvature instead of discrete character states, we were able to study periconid evolution without subjective categorization. Our results suggest that while there was an overarching pattern of periconid loss, 
High curvature within the mesial region of the second molar has evolved multiple times within the U primates without strong correlation in other cusps across the tooth surface, which supports the notion that periconic cusp morphology experiences strong selection as a consequence of functional demands in spite of phylogenetic constraint. As well, our approach has applications outside of just U primates and their periconids. Understanding character states as continuous rather than categorical variables can really help in multiple ways. It's better for smaller samples since you don't lose variation shrouded or muddied by categories, and it can capture morphological variations that aren't true cusps or that would be challenging to categorize. For example, the curvature in the periconid region of Arcasibus and Hapolemur. I would like to finish our presentation by acknowledging our funding sources, our departments, both the Duke Evolutionary Anthropology Department and the Duke Department of Mathematics, um, and acknowledging the Tooth and Claw Working Group at Duke and other members of the Boyer Lab.